you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. On this episode, we venture into Utah, the Beehive State, and one of the most naturally diverse states across America. Home to the only venomous lizard in the states, the wonderfully named Gila Monster. Yet it would seem that Utah has plenty of other monsters we need to keep our eyes out for. David Weatherly returns to take us out across the lands, diving into the many and varied encounters and events that surround a little place called Skinwalker Ranch. We've also some very unique Bigfoot sightings, killer babies from Native American traditions, lake monsters, dogmen, and even phantom kangaroos. But before that, don't forget you can support Mysteries and Monsters on Patreon at patreon.com slash mysteriesandmonsters. $4 a month gets you ad-free episodes, guaranteed early releases, bonus content, and more. A big thank you to my latest patrons, Victoria, Frank, and Maureen. Thank you to you and everyone else that supports the show. It really does help. You can find Mysteries and Monsters across all social media platforms. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and please subscribe to the Mysteries and Monsters channel on YouTube. You can also find us at mysteriesandmonsters.com for news, episodes, and merchandise. Thank you as always to Dean Bestall for his marvellous artwork. The show is produced by Brennan Storr of the Ghost Story Guys. And Mysteries and Monsters is delighted and humbled to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. Also, thank you to Morag for your lovely gift of your latest book. And if you want to check her out, you can find Morag on Amazon under Morag Zuck, and there'll be a link in the show notes as usual. So, let's join David Weatherly as we head out to Utah on the hunt for adventure. And yet we may regret what we stumble across. Utah, the Beehive State, is one of the most varied terrain areas in the lower 48, from thriving pine forests to sprawling mountain regions as deserts. A state that embraces its state reptile, the much misunderstood Gila Monster, is also home to some of the more elusive monsters of the country. Bigfoot, a Bear Lake Monster, Hellhounds, Water Babies, UFOs. Utah has tales to excite any lover of cryptids. Oh. And of course, you may have heard of a little place called Skinwalker Ranch. And who better to take us out on the hunt than our good friend, David Weatherly. David, a warm welcome back, sir. Good afternoon, my friend. It's always good to talk to you. A uh, pleasure. A pleasure. I knew we were due for a, for a chat, but it, it, it's, as, as always, it's never a chore, but it always surprises me sometimes how, how often we speak, and yet sometimes we have long breaks between it. And uh, I got a couple of emails recently basically berating me for not getting you back on the show but obviously I'm a man <laughs> I am a man who works around your schedule and I know you are an incredibly busy gentleman that's that that is true uh usually writing or traveling or something but uh as I said it's always great to be on your show thank you so the summer's treated you well I know you've uh, done a, a recent dogman conference and obviously been out investigating and continuing to write David so uh, how's the summer and and the recharging of the batteries been for you it's it's been a good year, uh, you know. Took a, a little bit of well deserved downtime, I think, and uh, but beyond that, you know, still still writing. Uh, I'm in the midst of actually three three different projects at the same time at the moment, and uh, continuing on with this Monsters of America series as well as a couple of other things. And uh, it's yeah, it's just been good. It's been uh, been a great year so far. Yes. So as I mentioned in my introduction, we're probably going to do in my opinion david i think this state has come from quite far behind in the sort of top 10 of american mysterious states over the last 20 years to come from somewhere where there wasn't particularly much unless you knew where to go or you looked into certain areas due to some of the the uniqueness about this particular state to being i would say now one of the most well-known strange areas in the states yeah i think that's pretty accurate i mean it's 
kind of interesting. Utah is a fascinating place. And, you know, even within the United States, a lot of people don't know a whole lot about Utah unless they've been there. Uh, I used to joke that it's one of those places that you rarely meet people who moved from Utah and mm. went somewhere else. Uh, now, you know, there's some common misconceptions about it, of course, because uh, the immediate thing that springs to the mind of many people is, oh, that's the the Mormon state. You know, it's all, yeah. it's all Mormons, uh, which, yes, there are an incredible uh, presence there, you know, in terms of the amount of members of the church and so forth. But uh, the entire state is not, you know, <laughs> yeah. not owned and run by, by Mormons, as many people would believe. Mm. Uh, however, you know, it's also a state that has just some incredible uh, wild areas, national parks, uh, rural areas that are, are just spectacular, uh, very terrain. And it's a pretty large state, you know, with uh, comparatively low populace for the size of the state. So uh, again, a lot of wilderness area. You know, it's one of those places that I frequently bring up when the topic of Bigfoot comes up uh, and any one of a skeptical mindset often says, well, you know, there's people everywhere, you know, we would, uh, we would have a body, we would, you know, have more solid evidence if that creature was really out there. And I frequently point to the state of Utah and I say, you know, you look at a map of Utah, it's intersected by two primary interstates, one that runs north to south, the other east to west. And the bulk of the population lives along those corridors. Uh, so outside of that, yeah, you do have rural communities, but you have vast tracts of land that just don't see a, a daily human presence. So uh, I think it's a good good example of how much wild area there is in the United States and how much uh, potential space there is for unknown creatures to be lurking. Mm -hmm. It's it's quite peculiar because I know probably about a week after we arranged our our chat. I was watching Josh Gates on Expedition Unknown, and he did an episode on the Donna Party, David, which is one of those things that obviously the main bulk of the horrendous story of that particular ill fated expedition is in California. But a large portion of their journey crossed through Utah, and it was the problems they found getting through Utah that caused them to end up getting stuck where they did. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. I mean, it's, it, even today, a lot of it is very rugged terrain. So, you know, if you're, if you're out in the wild in Arizona, you do have to be fairly careful. Definitely. It's, um, as, as, as I say, it was quite surprising that even though they were going through in the summer, they still ended up making so many wrong decisions and, and ending up, you know, trying to get their carts and, and wagons and cattle all through this particular area. It just seemed like it, it was like a a really bad version of Hansel and Gretel that they were leaving <laughs> leaving a trail behind right. them, David, that they essentially would have needed when it came to uh, getting stuck in the uh, Californian mountains during a snowstorm. Yes, that's correct. So I think when we touch on Utah, we can't really start anywhere else. It's, it's the elephant in the room when it comes to this particular state and probably one of the reasons it's so well known these days. And this is, of course, the infamous Skinwalker Ranch, which is gone from whispers on message boards in the late 90s to a wildly successful book being heavily featured on Coast to Coast at the turn of the century and Art Bell speaking with, with George Knapp and, and Colin McCallaner in regards to their work there and Bigelow and everything and then the mysterious new owners and the new TV show that's been running for the last few years as well. As somebody that's knee deep in these kind of subjects, David. Was, when was the first time you came across Skinwalker Ranch? Because I remember sort of hearing whispers and seeing little bits about this place just before the books came out, when it all sort of kicks off from that point on. Yeah, well, of course, the the Hunt for the Skinwalker book, uh, which was uh, Kellyer and Knapp, uh, really put this place on the map, so to speak. Uh, I had heard about it prior to that. Uh, a close friend of mine was actually one of the, uh, probably the first person to actually investigate the ranch. That is uh, Christopher O'Brien, who is mostly today really well known as the the main expert on the cattle mun mutilation. Yes. Uh, but you know, Chris was contacted uh, by the original owners when they were looking to sell the place. And he went up there and spoke with them. And, uh, you know, of course, once... Bigelow took over the property. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, 
for some reason with that. That is Robert Bigelow, who is uh, well known as Bigelow Air and Space uh, lead and has purportedly always had an interest in strange phenomena. And he purchased the property essentially to utilize it as a a laboratory, you know, a, a, a field location to do a close study and to try to uh, see how much of this weird phenomena they could uh, catalog and mm. track. And the places, uh, it's one of those areas of, of high strangeness. You know, you can call this a window zone or uh, any number of other terms that have been utilized over the years. But it's an area that has a high concentration of weird activity and and it's across the board uh, it's not just ufo sightings or creature sightings it, it's a an incredibly diverse range of weirdness uh, there are numerous accounts of bigfoot dogmen other strange animals there's ufo sightings there are reports of of various humanoids there are reports of of portals opening, for lack of a better word. People say that they've seen these holes in the sky uh, that clearly go to another place. You know, it might be nighttime and this weird rip happens in the sky and it's daylight, uh, daytime on the other side. Uh, so it's just this intense, wide range of activity that that honestly uh, extends well beyond the ranch. The ranch has become a focal point in part because it's gotten so much media attention over the years. You know, the uh, this is one of those, quote, secret locations that was not so <laughs> secret uh, because, you know, it's, it sort of points the finger at it. You know, a millionaire comes in and uh, purchases the place, locks it down and says there's nothing to see here. It makes everyone think there's something to see there. <laughs> so it, it puts much more attention on it. And uh you know, stories got out over the years that Bigelow owned the place. But I found, uh, I, I did a lot of research in that region of Utah. The Skinwalker Ranch sits in what's called the Uinta Basin. And this is a pretty wide uh, area geographically that in full experiences strange phenomena. I, I investigated tons of accounts that did not occur on the ranch, but certainly match the, uh, you know, the patterns of phenomena that were going on on the ranch. So mm. uh, there's something about that entire region that is just uh, anomalous for, you know, we really don't know why. But the accounts, you know, one of the, the most famous, of course, is the what they dubbed the bulletproof wool. Yes. And uh, that was an account that Really, it kind of sets the tone for the Hunt for the Skinwalker book. Uh, and it involves the original owners who <clears throat> come home one day and uh, see this, what they think is a wolf, uh, you know, trotting across the property. And they kind of decide that, oh, it must be uh, tame because it comes up. It's acting very friendly to them. And they kind of get the sense that the family name is uh, Sherman. The Shermans kind of get the sense that something's not quite right with this creature. It keeps eyeing the uh, cattle pen that's nearby. And uh, this is a short version of the story. But what happens is this wolf suddenly leaps over to the pen. It grabs a calf and tries to yank it through the, the pen, tries to yank this uh, poor cow out. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Shermans quickly react. They pull out a firearm and they fire on this wolf with a three fifty seven Magnum at first, and uh, it doesn't phase it. Uh, there's there's no blood. There's no effect on this animal at all. And uh, the animal continues to try to to yank out this calf through the through the rails. So eventually, as the this weird encounter is unfolding, you know they're they're beating on this thing. They're they're trying to get it out. One of the Shermans runs in and gets a 30 out six uh, out of the house, comes back, fires on this thing and watches a chunk of its flesh come off <laughs> and land. And eventually it kind of, it lets go of the calf and it kind of uh, just trots off across the land. And um, Sherman and his, his son pursued it, followed the tracks and it just vanishes. 
uh, you know, the, the tracks are in the mud, but the tracks suddenly end and the thing has just disappeared. Now that story, you know, there's different opinions about how much truth there is to the account. And, uh, at the same time, when you hear other stories that have come from the ranch, you know, it's, it kind of says, well, it, you know, it probably did occur pretty much how they, they said it did, uh, because there are so many strange tales and it, it becomes a mixture of almost mythology at this point, because there are Native Americans in the region, the, the Ute Nation is mm-hmm. close by. And they have stories about the, the ranch and the area around the ranch and say that it's a, a taboo place. And uh, there's a, a story that says that the home of the skinwalker is nearby. And that's why there's so much of a curse on the land for strange things to happen. Uh, skinwalker, of course, is a whole nother supernatural being that is primarily linked to the Navajos, but there's a curious story between the Navajos and the use that we can get into if you want to. Yeah. Uh, but needless to say, there are so many accounts from the ranch and so many people that have experienced things over the years that, uh, you know, at this point, it would kind of take volumes to even start to come <laughs> with it all. <laughs> yes. I, I think it's one of those places where there's, there's not much that doesn't happen, really. And I've always found it quite strange. It, for me, the, the, the focus on the two strange incidents with the wolf because obviously we've got the one that tries to to steal the calf and then you've got the other one with mrs sherman who has that encounter with the giant wolf looking in a car that i think some people who don't dive into it think that every all the weird things that are going on at this place are these giant wolves and and weird things now there are several reports of odd creatures i know they keep reporting some strange kind of hyena looking beast dashing about everywhere across the the ranch and, and the surrounding land as well, David. But it, it's one of those things, like I say, when people talk about what happened during the, the Mothman flap, that the Mothman's quite a small portion of that incident and everything else that happens is just the real weirdness. And I think Skinwalker Ranch is quite similar in that fact that a lot of people focus on two or three incidents where everything else that's going on seems to be all to do with strange lights in the sky as we were saying about these portals appearing strange readings poltergeist activity odd things occurring so it's it's strange how people sometimes get fixated on a tiny portion of a particular series of events as though that's the main crux of what's going on here when clearly everything's out there yeah and there's you know, there's a few reasons for that one is that of course certain stories get a lot of publicity and it's funny because, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who've read the, the Hunt for the Skinwalker book. And the one story that seems to stick in their heads is the Bulletproof Wolf, uh, <laughs> because it, uh, it somewhat sets the tone, I guess, for, you know, a lot of what happens um, that uh, Kelly or Annette chronicled. But there's so many other things in that book alone. And then, you know, in the ensuing years, uh, people that... Uh, you know, a lot of people snuck onto the property when Bigelow owned it and he had 24 hour security. I mean, they patrol, they, you know, they did everything they can, they could to keep people off. Uh, but it's a big piece of land. Mm. And as I stated earlier, you know, when you draw that much attention to something and say, there's nothing to see here, people become curious. Mm. So a lot of people, you know, would, would slip onto the property and document things. And, uh, there are sightings of, of Bigfoot that have taken place on the the property and a uh, whole wide range of other, other things. But, you know, very often uh, when you look at something like this, there's a certain segment of people who, who study strange things, who get kind of nervous about the idea that so many different types of phenomena occur yeah. on the land. And, uh, you know, for instance, I, I think we've talked about this before, Paul, there's there are a lot of UFO researchers who get very uneasy when you bring up the topic of Bigfoot or other strange creatures mm. uh, because, you know, they don't want any kind of implication that anyone is saying, well, you know, this this weird creature came out of this flying saucer and they kind of back up and say, well, well wait a minute, you know, that's science fiction or something else. Yeah. Uh, unless it's an alien gray, it probably didn't come out of a UFO, but, uh, <laughs> you know, that's... <laughs> I mean, that's a whole nother rabbit hole we could go do yeah. you know, at some point. But, uh, <laughs> you know, when it comes to the ranch, uh, certainly some of the more startling stories involve these weird 
creature incidents. And, you know, one of my favorites, uh, I've actually been asked about it a number of times. There's not a whole lot to the story, but it, it's, <laughs> it's kind of fascinating nonetheless. There was an incident that involved purportedly two BIA officials mm. uh, who were driving down a back road of the ranch. And uh, BIA, for those not familiar with uh, the term, is Bureau of Indian Affairs. And uh, these two officials, they were they were patrolling an area of the ranch, and uh, they saw a pair of figures standing on the side of the road. So the, the officers stopped their vehicle. Uh, they get out to look at these figures, and they notice that there are humanoids standing on two legs, uh, wearing trench coats, smoking cigarettes, <laughs> but they have canine heads. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's so bizarre that, you know, on, on some level, it's almost cartoonish. On another level, it, it's really creepy. <laughs> you know, it's like a pair of werewolves taking a smoke break for something. <laughs> there. And uh, these two officers, you know, they're out of the car. They look at each other and then they look back at the figures. And in those few seconds, these, these whatever these are, these canids have disappeared. And there's nothing left but smoking, you know, cigarette butts on the ground. <laughs> and, you know, I think that's the, that account in some ways is sort of the epitome of the ranch because it's so bizarre uh, that, you know, you think on one level, there's no way this is possible. But then on another level, you're hearing from people who are, you know, arguably trained observers who are, you know, not reporting this for any kind of publicity or anything else, but simply saying, this is what we saw. We can't explain it. And no one else can either. Yeah. I had to, the, the very first time I saw that, I, I was incredulous. I just thought that, that this just can't be real because it's so odd. Not only, I mean, even if you just worked on the principle of, of two dogmen type figures, Having a cigarette, David. That's strange enough. But the fact they're wearing trench coats mm -hmm. and just hanging around takes it to a different level. So it, it it's one of those things. I've I've said this to before when I've spoken with people. When we talk about these weird things on on whichever part of the the Fortean realm you want to take a slice of and look into, I don't understand where the line is that people won't cross. You know, as we were saying about certain UFO researchers won't deal with anything that isn't an alien appearing under a, around a UFO sighting or something like that. Or when we get into cattle mutilations, people won't deal with the mysterious black helicopters or strange chemicals being found. They just want to deal right. with the carcass itself. So yeah, every time you think you've heard everything about this particular area, something else appears or we hear another report that comes out and it just makes you think... Where where do we stop here? How 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 far are you going to push <laughs> our yeah. concepts of of what we can accept? And yet, it it's one of those places that if you just go into it, I think looking at it on a purely basic level of it, well, it can only be this. When you come across the smoking dogman story, that kind of just even for people I I would imagine who are firmly in the dogmen exist camp. I would imagine some of them will draw the line at that because I can't think of any other area where we've got a report of one of them having a cigarette. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm kind of fortunate. I believe in that uh, my background has, uh, I, I've always taken a very open-minded holistic approach to these things. So uh, it's, it's well within my comfort zone when I start looking at regions where just everything seems to be occurring, you know, they've, they've, Whatever is behind this, whether it's a singular entity or group of entities or a higher consciousness or, you know, alien intelligence or, you know, some kind of divine matrix, who knows? But whatever it is, sometimes just picks these areas and says, you know what, we're throwing everything in here and see what these humans do. Uh, you know, it, it's, I find it all the more intriguing. Now, as you know, John Keel was a big influence on me and, you know, and I, I I remember uh, Keel telling me once, you know, that just, he said, just don't discard anything. When you're looking at, <laughs> when you're following these reports and talking to people, don't, don't discard anything. And yeah. unfortunately, you know, modern researchers, we have a good percentage of them who do discard a lot. And, uh, you know, they'll 
they'll listen to a fascinating account, but as soon as something is introduced that's outside of their box, they pitch the whole thing. And yeah. they want to know there's nothing to this. The woman is, you know, this, this witness is, is trackers or, you know, she's imagining things. Or yeah. Uh, but, you know, the whole, the whole dog man topic alone, as you said, is, is bizarre enough as it is. And when you throw in something like this, where, uh, you know, oh, they're standing around smoking a couple of cigarettes, it's just, <laughs> it's a whole nother level of strangeness. But I, I'll tell you, one of the, uh, one of the, probably creepiest and, and uh, most interesting accounts that I've ever heard personally about a, a dog man slash werewolf, whatever you want to call it, was a case that I investigated in Duchesne County. And uh, this was this was a gentleman who you know, owns a farm uh, out in the county and a uh, be- beautiful place. And one day discovered uh, he and his son worked the ranch and uh, they discovered one of their animals slaughtered. Mm. Uh, first they discovered that it was missing. It was a sheep. Uh, they discovered that it was missing when they eventually found it. Uh, it, it was just a horrible sight. The animal had been torn open. The internal organs had been eaten. And this gentleman, you know, he's lived in that region for gosh, I don't know, decades. And his first thought was, oh, well, this could be a rogue mountain lion or, or something. Some kind of predator has come down. And as they're examining the, the carcass, they find, uh, they determine through tracks and so forth that it's actually uh, something canine that has uh, attacked this animal. So they decide to try to get this thing. They know it'll be back. Hmm. They put all the sheep in the barn and they set up all night in shifts. Uh, watching for this thing, their armed rifles in hand, and sure enough, the, the early in the morning, just uh, just as the sun was starting to come up, this gentleman's son, who was on uh, watch at the moment, saw something moving uh, over the rise that comes into the field where the sheep are kept, and uh, he, he, you know, he gets his father awake, and the two are watching this thing, and. He told me, and I, I sat and talked to these two gentlemen. I mean, they, you know, the sincerity and still the almost outright fear or disturbance, you know, from the incident was still with them. And this was, this was quite some time later that I had spoken with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was in, cause I, the incident occurred in, oh, I think it was 03, 2003. And it was probably about four years later that I actually spoke with them and got the account. And he told me, the father told me that he put his rifle up and he put this thing in his scope and he's realizing, you know, along the way that this looks like some kind of very large wool. And when he gets this thing in the scope of his gun, this animal stops moving and it stands up on its hind legs and looks straight at him. Now they were hidden behind this area back behind the, the farm and you know, he says, there's no way this thing, he doesn't think could have seen him, but it was as if it sensed the scope that it was in the scope mm. and, uh, it stood up on two legs and, uh, <laughs> you know, it looked straight at him and then it, it stood there for, you know, a couple of beats and then it took away on, uh, took off on two legs and disappeared. But, uh, this gentleman, you know, he said it, it's. He hated to use the word, but he said, you know, this is essentially it looked like a werewolf, you know, from the movies or something. It was this massive creature and it, it was terrifying. Mm. Uh, so, you know, you talk to people like this and they've clearly experienced something that is just beyond a rational explanation. Yeah. There is this weird supernatural aspect to some of these reports as well, as you say there. It's impossible for that creature to have seen them. And even if it did, why would it react in the way? That it would. Most animals, if they sense a hunter or, or they feel threatened, they will just depart. What they won't do, and this often happens in in these kind of reports, is show off or or, or sort of bristle with, with some kind of canid arrogance, David, and say, Well, mm-hmm. you think you think you've you've got me in your sights. Look what I can do. And as soon as they suddenly start to display behaviour that changes people's perceptions it seems to really frighten the witnesses and this happens all over when we hear about these reports that you will come across these ones where these creatures 
seem to take some malicious relish in terrifying anybody that spots them in this manner. That's correct. And, you know, this particular incident, I mean, this was essentially very uh, aggressive behavior. You know, this this thing was standing up as uh, almost as a saying, you will not shoot at me. <laughs> you, you know, you dare not. Uh, and uh, despite the distance, I, I mean, it was it was terrifying to mm. these two men who were observing it. And, uh, you know, I guess this creature, whatever it was, got its point across. Yeah. For me, David, it would be easier for those two chaps to never talk about that story, especially with somebody like yourself, rather than firstly admit to what they saw and also the fact that they had this, still had this emotional response to an event. Because obviously this challenged everything they understood about where they lived and what they knew about the world around them. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But, you know, in, um, in some cases, I mean, with these gentlemen, uh, as I stated, it was several years later that they talked to me about it. And I think that time gives a certain level of comfort. But at the same time, you know, they were interested in talking to someone who uh, could perhaps give them some answers or who would at least listen to them and mm. not not laugh and say, you know, you're 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 drinking moonshine or you're, you know, you're imagining things or making it up or something. Uh, so, you know, to them, it was, I think, satisfying to have someone take the account seriously and, mm-hmm. and discuss some different potential things that could explain it. You know, even though this is a, a very difficult area to explain, you know, at least uh, hearing about other similar accounts and things that sort of match that, uh, I think, gave them a certain level of comfort and maybe at least made them feel like, well, we're not, you know, losing our minds or or hallucinating. There are other people having these experiences too. So that gives a certain level of, of uh, comfort, I believe. Yeah. As I mentioned there about some of these encounters having this strange kind of supernatural or baffling aspects to them, the portion in the book where you mentioned that there's another farmer who's having reports of seeing some strange creature sort of lurking around on the edge of his fields. And you got, you, you actually went to the site and set up some cameras and they said, oh yeah, we've heard all these weird things and he'd seen it and his dog had, had, had run off and everything. And then you had this really weird incident with the camera trap they'd set up as well. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, <laughs> that was a very bizarre case too. That was a, a gentleman living in a farmhouse and, um, you know, he, he contacted me initially uh, because there were some indications that the house itself was haunted. Mm. And he was uh, having what he described as poltergeist-like activity. Uh, I don't think he used the term. He, when he was telling me, I, I said, you know, this sounds like poltergeist-type activity. And um, anyway, you know, some conversations. And then uh, I visited the house. And actually had a, a weird incident when I initially visited the house because I, I went in with one other investigator and the gentleman and his family are there. And uh, to the left is a, an open kitchen area. And as we all walked in, uh, one of the chairs at the kitchen table sort of slid out and and turned uh, as if inviting me to sit down. And <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest with you, my immediate reaction was uh, rather colorful, you know, <laughs> <laughs> okay. you know, BS basically. Mm. Uh, so, you know, because I've been in those situations before where people try to hoax something and, you know, they want publicity or want to be on television or whatever it is. Uh, mm. But, you know, we look for every potential way that could have been done and it just, there was no explanation for it. Now I'll, I'll add to that by saying a lot of people don't know this uh, about me, but I, for time, performed as a stage magician. Mm. And uh, I, I studied performance magic for a, a long time. I still dabble in a little occasionally, but, um, you know, the result is that I, I have a, I feel like I have a pretty strong foundation for how various types of trickery can be done. Yeah. Uh, especially when it's physical manipulation like that. Mm. And uh, there was simply nothing to explain this. Now, the case got more bizarre because the gentleman eventually told me uh, something he was hesitant to talk about at first, and that's the fact that he was uh, observing this bizarre creature uh, that was in the yard. And uh, his lifelong hunter, he described this thing as, as being a, uh, essentially a werewolf, you know, a, a bipedal canid type creature that was stalking around the property. And, 
you know, he he called me at one point and swore this thing was on the roof of the house, mm. uh, clomping around and, and recorded these strange sounds. It does sound like something walking on the roof. Uh, we had an incident where we put trail cams out in the area where this gentleman said that he had seen this creature uh, frequently. Uh, the camera disappeared. The strap had been cut somehow. It, it reappeared later at a completely different location. Uh, just, uh, all, uh, just a whole handful of bizarre things. And this is, again, in the Uinta Basin, although it's not, of course, not on the ranch. Uh, but, you know, you can't get much closer to uh, <laughs> the same type of ranch-like activity as what was occurring at this particular spot. And uh, this gentleman, he had young kids, so he wasn't long before he moved out of the house. He just couldn't deal with what was going on there, and he was worried about the safety of his family. Mm. Uh, so they they left the property, and then... Uh, yeah, I've never been able to go back to it. I contacted the owners at one point and they wanted nothing to do with it, of course. And uh, I have no idea who's living there now or what they're experiencing. It would be curious to know. Yes. Yeah, well, it, it is odd as well, like you said, because there are so many of these properties, because I've seen several programs where they've gone to other residences in the in the locality, David, that seem to be suffering very similar things. And there seems to be a lot of these kind of poltergeist infestations that seem to be going on. They don't seem to be having as many sort of weird creature sightings, but there just seem to be this pattern in this whole area, which once again lends you to that train of thought that it's it's not just the Skinwalker Ranch area that weird things are going on. Everywhere around this seems to be a whole window of high strangeness, as, as, as we mentioned earlier. Um, and... And as we touched on a, a moment ago, when we're talking about the the whole sort of legacy of this particular area in, in Native American history because of the Utes and their conflict with the Navajo, you've got this whole sort of secondary history that I think some people just kind of overlook because they just presume, well, it must be to do with the Navajo because of the skinwalkers or it must be a Nav Navajo reservation or whatever, but clearly they're not there. And this is the reason that the Utes believe that the skinwalkers are there is that they were cursed because of their behavior and some of the um, decisions they made in the 19th century, shall we say? Yeah, that's, that's correct. And that, uh, again, that's a very rich history that uh, would be time consuming to dig into too much. But uh, I do touch on it in the book to give some background to people. Uh, and the, the sort of short version of the story is that uh, there was a, a very old conflict between the Utes and the Navajos and um, it, the the Skinwalker, which is a uh, shape shifting witch. It, it's a human who has followed a dark path and has uh, delved into very dark magic and has achieved the ability to shape shift into another creature, uh, fully or partially, um, as long as they have the skin of that creature, whether mm. that's a coyote skin or a wolf skin or uh, the skin of a bird or something else. Uh, they can even shape shift into another human if they have that human's skin. So you can't get much creepier than those stories. Uh, but the the skinwalkers, you know, you hear plenty of tales of them uh, around the Navajo reservation. Uh, but there's a really old story that claims that the Navajos uh, being angry at what the Utes had done to them, uh, essentially sold them out to the U.S. government. Uh, the the Navajos purportedly cursed the Utes with the curse of the Skinwalker, and it, it's sort of hazy when you try to get exact details of what that means. You'll hear different versions from different uh, Ute elders, but uh, essentially it means that they are purportedly perhaps plagued by Skinwalkers, and there is in fact a region of. Uh, of Utah, its own Ute land that is known as being the home of the Skinwalker, and they don't let anybody go back there. Um, I, a few different researchers have tried over the years, uh, and you know they they won't let any of us go back there, and they say it's too dangerous. Mm. Uh, they don't they don't want to talk about it. Uh, but you know, their stories of these Skinwalkers uh, as a result has spread over northern Utah and. Uh, became attached to the ranch primarily because of the book. Yeah. Uh, because Kelly and, and Colm, for whatever reason, you know, decided to, uh, Kelly and now, excuse me, had decided to utilize that 
title for their book, you know, Hot for the Skinwalker. And it's a, it's kind of another fascinating aspect of what's going up there, on up there in that region. And, uh, you know, who knows? I mean, maybe that does explain some of the weird dogman type sightings. Mm. And it, well, it doesn't surprise me, David, because I think often for people who don't really have much understanding about the reservations and the sacred lands that are still entrenched in, in certain tribes' history and, and the way that they conduct themselves in the modern era, I think for anybody who's not used to, to, the, to the way these areas are run and, and how they manage themselves, they would be quite surprised. And yet, even somebody as well-known and well-connected and respected in the area as Junior Hicks, even he was turned down. And yet, he's a guy that they had a really good relationship with. Everybody thought they could trust him. He was a salt-of-the-earth kind of guy. Everybody really liked him, found him a man of integrity. And even he couldn't get in. Mm -hmm. That's correct, yeah. So, I mean, that just shows you, because wasn't Hicks sort of collecting stories from the 1950s onwards as well, which shows you just how far back this whole series of weird things goes? Oh, yeah. I mean, he did an incredible job of, of gathering accounts up there. And, of course, he was part of the community. And, uh, you know, it, it reached a point where people would just come to him and, and share their accounts uh, because they knew he was trustworthy and would take the matter seriously. So uh, he built uh, quite a database of information about strange things going on up there and in large part UFO sightings, but uh, other accounts too. Mm -hmm. I think, I think the last point on all this strangeness I want to touch on is obviously these days, as we were laughing, you know, jokingly mentioning, it's one of those secret areas that where everybody knows where it is, like Area 51 with the big signs out. <laughs> so you're in right. Area 51. Um, obviously now you've got a television show which has got a team of investigators on there. We've got regular episodes. They've, they've done tons of interviews, both podcasts and, and, and television and, and print. So it, it's gone from this kind of mysterious whispered area when Nids and, and Bigelow had it to a very upfront. It, it, for me, it's probably the most transparent aspect of the whole history of, of Skinwalker Ranch now is that we know who's there, we know who owns it, we know what's going on and we know what they're after. So looking at from where it's come from to where it is, do you think that's quite strange or do you just think that's a natural progression in this modern era of, of paranormal television, as it were? Yeah, I think it's natural to a degree. Uh, you know, I, I believe it, it, it certainly reached a point where they couldn't feasibly continue, you know, secret research there. Not, <laughs> not when you've got people, you know, constantly coming on the property and, and constant interest. So uh, I think it was probably the, the next logical step that was taken in order to try to determine, you know, exactly what's going on and gather some data from there. So, yeah, I, I believe that's true. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it obviously it's, it's it's one of those particular places in in North America that just seems to have a real appetite about anything that goes on in this particular area, and I think that people's interest in it is just probably going to continue and grow as it has done steadily over the last twenty years. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm completely at a loss, Dave, because for everything I hear that I don't believe, I then hear something that makes me think, well, actually, I I, I <laughs> it's one of those cases that I really yo-yo on, I go from thinking none of it's true to thinking, well, actually. So uh, it, it, even for me, as as someone, I'd like to consider myself as quite open-minded, even I have a real sort of internal struggle with anything to do with Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah, I, I can understand that. Good. Uh, <laughs> just, I, well, I didn't say I agreed with it, but I can, <laughs> but I can understand it. Uh, you know, like I said, it, it falls well within my field, but um, yeah, I, I totally get where you're coming from with it because it it is difficult. And, you know, there have been times that I've heard accounts from there and I just kind of, I, I shake my head for a minute and think, wait a minute, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, then again, when you put it into the overall tapestry of what makes up that region, then, you know, pretty much anything goes. And uh, by that account, you know, we really have to step back and just continue, I believe, to try to look at patterns and try to understand exactly what's happening. I, I believe that we're still quite some time off from understanding these things scientifically because a place like Skinwalker Ranch, it, it just, 
it gives the implication that there's something that is, oh, I hesitate to say it, but almost intelligently or consciously interfering with the overall process mm. in order to, you know, prevent complete understanding. So, you know, until, uh, I think until we get to the point where we have different ways to track this activity or observe it, you know, the, the old technology, it gives us intriguing hints, but it's not enough yet. Mm. That's, that's just where it is. You know, we can take recordings, we can, we can look at things in, in thermal imaging, we can catch photographs, you know, but, um, but it's not enough yet. We have to keep going and keep trying to, uh, I think, look at this in different ways. And ultimately, you know, a more quantum science oriented approach will probably begin to give us some answers in terms of anomalous activity, because it's just beyond what our traditional science has been so far. Hmm. Yeah. I think it, it, it does need that wide, wider spectrum of, of investigation, because as you say, if you go in there as a ufologist, you'll ignore everything. If you go in there as a cryptozoologist, you'll ignore everything that doesn't fit in your parameters. So you have to probably look at it in, in, a, in a different manner to, to what normally would go on. And as you say, there are numerous reports of places all over the place where people have just ignored in, information that they've been given because it doesn't fit into what they're researching, which is a real shame. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one of the other great aspects of, of Utah is, once again, we um, when we spoke about Montana, is I love these... Native American tales of water babies, because these are always quite odd, David. Um, and obviously, when we were dealing with Montana, we had a, a very interesting story about uh, a water baby that would eat people by their fingers. <laughs> <laughs> and here in a certain part of, of Utah, we have a very similar kind of story, which I always find really interesting that you have tribal law from different tribes talking about very similar creatures with very similar end results for unfortunate people that cross them. Right. Yeah. But, uh, I, I mean, I have to say the, it, it, it's, it's really close between the, the tail out of, uh, Utah and the one out of Montana, which is, is the most disturbing. I, I guess <laughs> certainly if you're a woman, you're going to say the one from Utah is much more disturbing. But, yeah. Uh, it, it's a native tale that says that um, a woman had um, put her baby. Now, this is a really old tale. So the the child was on what's called a cradle board, and this is a board. If you ever seen have seen uh, old depictions of old uh, Native American, you know, art or photographs or so so forth, you'll, you'll see. Uh, images of the women carrying the child and this sort of thing that's wrapped around a, a stiff board. And, uh, exactly like it sounds. It's a, a board that is kind of serves as a cradle, but it's also able to be, you know, the child is able to be carried and so forth. And it just keeps the child secure hmm. and in place. And uh, so these these women were out picking berries and they had, uh, the one woman had a, a, a baby. It was in a cradle board. She leaned it against a tree and went to uh, gather berries. Now, this was near a river, and purportedly what occurred was that a water baby came out of the water, uh, devoured the child, and took its form. So what now appears to be the woman's baby uh, begins to cry, and of course the woman comes to attend to the child, uh, thinking that it's hungry, she begins to nurse it. And as she does, she realizes that something is wrong. She starts screaming for help. Those other women who are out picking berries, they rush over to see what's happening. And they find that this child, actually a water baby, had devoured the woman's breast and was continuing to eat the woman. And they try to save this woman by, they try to cut the breast off, but it doesn't. They're not able to do it. And this creature eventually devours the entire woman. And um, the sort of the, 
<laughs> the swan song to the whole thing is that, of course, it swallows the mother, it goes into the water, and uh, the tribe tells the husband what has happened. And uh, he reports that later on, he's near the same body of water, and here, here's his wife crying out and calling to him. So, mm. you know, this is within this theme. Uh, these, these water baby tales, uh, they're, you know, sometimes you read them and you think, wow, this is just so bizarre and, and fantastic that there couldn't possibly be any truth to it. Mm. Uh, but they, they cross some interesting territory because at times we hear them described as something very similar to uh, what we would think of as a mermaid. Yeah. Uh, but then they also take on these other bizarre aspects, the shape-shifting ability. Um, very frequently in the water baby stores, I have found them in various locations around the West, uh, mm. Nevada, Montana, uh, of course, Utah. And, and what you hear is that these creatures are able to cry like a human child in order to uh, lure in prey. Mm. Uh, so some of the tales, you know, it sounds like we're talking about possibly some kind of an animal that is predatory, uh, that has a, a bizarre vocalization. Uh, certainly, you know, we have known examples of that. Uh, if you've ever heard a, a bobcat scream in the wild, it's, <laughs> it's a very chilling sound. You know, I, I can, you know, I grew up in the South and remember hearing bobcats screaming in the swamp and it sounds sometimes like a, a woman screaming or sometimes like a a, a, a child possibly, or, and it's a very weird sound. So, uh, you know, we look at, at known examples and we could say, okay, well, you know, maybe this is not too far off and maybe there is something to these tales. Mm. I've always been struck as well because obviously being in the British Isles, David, how some of these stories seem to have this changeling aspect to it, because obviously in fey law, there is this belief in the changeling where the that's right the fey will turn up and switch babies around and 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 replace them and right. i've been yeah so it's it's very interesting that you've got these parallels from cultures that have never met talking about something very similar obviously it doesn't devour its parents in in traditional fey law but it does cause them problems whereas for me to for, for two completely opposite cultures from opposite sides of the Atlantic to have very similar kind of structures to, to certain aspects of this. I, they're the things about these stories that I find so fascinating that how, how do they have something so similar? Because it sounds such a crazy idea anyway, and yet you can find two cultures that have something quite similar, which I find remarkable. Well, and there's another similarity too, in that, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of various tribes believe that even uh, hearing the water babies is an ill omen. Mm. Uh, so, you know, there's this idea that being in their presence can bring ill fortune, uh, bad luck. And, you know, there's different stories. I, I know we've discussed the, uh, Nevada book before, you know, but the account in there yes. about the gentleman who purportedly married this woman who was essentially a mermaid. And, uh, so she curses the tribe because she's, uh, cast out. Mm -hmm. And so you, you get that sort of, uh, you know, magical aspect that comes into some of these accounts. But again, there is a very curious connection between cultures that uh, we're talking about tales from periods, you know, when these cultures didn't have any known contact. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet there's a great deal of similarity in what they're talking about. There's obviously regional differences that uh, can be accounted for by the climate, the environment, you know, the, the traditional tales and so forth. But you sort of get this sense that uh, it, it, it's grand in a way because you get this idea that all of humanity is somehow connected on such a deeper level that, you know, most people don't even consider on a regular basis. Uh, but we all, we all have similar stories, don't we, regardless of where we came from? Yeah, I think often people overlook the similarities that you'll find around the world. It's like dragons, David. Why do, why do cultures from all over the world on every continent have stories of dragons? That's right. Yeah, that's another good example. So it's, it's fascinating. And I love these. I love discovering more and more about Native American law because obviously it's, it's something that I've just not been exposed to in, until very recently. And um, I managed to drop on a couple of wonderful books recently in a, in a local charity shop, which I can't wait to get into one 
one focusing on the, the Pacific Northwest and one focusing on some of the, the tribal law from from the central US. So I'm really looking forward to that. Cause I, before I started doing this show, David, I have to be brutally honest, I knew next to nothing about some of the <laughs> some of the tribal beliefs and, and, and their stories and legends. So I just the more I find out about the tribes and the stories and, and their history, I just find it so fascinating. Yeah, it's it's incredible. It really is. And the more you delve in, the the more you find those connections. Well as we were saying at the beginning, Utah is one of those states that those of the skeptical slant who don't believe in hairy creatures running around the US. David will probably go, oh, Bigfoot can't be down there. What's he doing down there? But Utah is is one of those states that once you dive into it and look at it, there's been stuff going on here for the best part of 150 years being reported. And there's some really odd stories about the Mormons and, and their belief in it that seems to be one of those things that's, it's one of those tall tales that somebody's repeated something they've read and everybody goes, oh, well, that must be true then. And then when you look into it, there's, there's very little basis <laughs> to it. <laughs> but there seems to have been such a long history. Once again, this is one of those states where there's been reports of hairy wild men. I mean, I love the bit about this particular area of the state where you've got Gorilla Ridge, Gorilla Creek and Gorilla Mine. And some people say, oh, yeah, well, that was because there was a really fat, hairy miner who used to live around there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but then you think, well, it's... Because obviously the gorilla wasn't that well known. And it's one of them where you think, well, yes, I know we knew what gorillas were by 1880, but I'm not being disparaging on the people who were living in Utah at that point in time, David. I find it very hard to believe that many people in the middle of Utah would have heard of gorillas with the greatest of respect. Right. No, you're absolutely right. And, you know, it, people uh, in the modern era, I think, sort of take for granted how Quickly, we now have access to information and you have to uh, take a few steps back when you start thinking about uh, things from much earlier periods, you know, uh, pre-internet, because, mm. uh, the, you know, we're not talking about just pre-internet. We're talking about pre-television, pre-radio. Uh, you know, people got their information from uh, stories that people were telling in the local saloon or in town or from newspapers, which... Uh, you know, would carry stories uh, from all over the place. Sometimes they would just fabricate stories, some, much like today. Uh, sometimes <laughs> they would, uh, you know, report valid news. Yeah. And uh, they would, of course, uh, reprint articles from other papers around the country. But often that took a long time. Uh, you know, often when I, I delve into research, you know, I find an interesting account. I, I always try to find the earliest source. And it's fascinating sometimes, you know, you'll find something like a, a an interesting wild man account. And, mm. uh, oh, here it's reported in 18, you know, 49. Uh, oh, but here it seems to have been reported in 1846. It's the same, it's the same story with a few slight alterations. And then you find another version of it a little bit further back. Mm. And, uh, you know, this is just a, a result of uh, the time period that people were living in. So, yeah, despite the fact that, you know, at a certain point, the world was familiar with gorillas. It doesn't mean that everyone instantly knew exactly what a gorilla was. Uh, and in fact, you know, early on when the animals were discovered, uh, of course, you know, gorillas were originally thought to be a myth. Yeah. Um, you know, mountain mountain gorillas, they thought, oh, no, that's that can't be true. That's just a native story, you know, from from Africa. But uh, when that is was eventually proven to be true, uh, it took some time before people fully realized exactly what a gorilla was. Mm -hmm. uh, so you heard a lot of variations on that. And then, of course, you know, when we reached the era of uh, uh, traveling menageries and, and circuses and so forth, you know, they would. Uh, bring gorillas around. So a lot of these people were exposed to them uh, briefly, albeit. But uh, still, you know, we're looking at periods that, yeah, absolutely. People en masse would not have known right away what a gorilla was necessarily. And, you know, wouldn't, you know, it's it's a big leap to say, oh, all those places were named after, you know, an actual gorilla because people, you know, saw a gorilla, <laughs> or, you know, in a show or something. No, that's not very likely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Plus, you've also got to work on the principle. If you've got to be that skeptical towards these particular periods of time, David, it often astounds me that people presume everybody could read as well, which they couldn't. That's right. That's right. Well, and there's a lot of, a lot of downsides. I mean, 
you know, I made a crack about uh, fake news a few minutes ago, but the truth is, is that sadly, there are a lot of researchers who will look at old reports uh, from, you know, newspapers in the 1800s and even early 1900s and say, oh, that's, you know, all they did was make the news up. Mm. Well, <laughs> you know, uh, the, you might as well say that all the news is reported today is 100% factual. Uh, it, it's simply not the case. I mean, you can look at plenty of old newspapers and, uh, you know, people bring that up to me and I say, well, wait a minute, look at some of the accounts of the American Civil War. Yeah. World, World War I, uh, you know, presidential assassination of Lincoln. Look at all these things. These are actual reports. You know, this is this is news. This is fact. Look at some of the regional news. You know, someone's reporting uh, what the mayor in their town did, you know, make yeah. this kind of deal. I said, this is not all fake news. Did some of those stories wind up in there? Absolutely. Hmm. Uh, but in hindsight, you know, we often are able to distinguish when something is, uh, you know, a bit of uh, let, let's have fun and, you know, write about a strange creature. And yeah. uh, when something is... Hey, here's this report. This guy saw, you know, a wild man and shot at it and it scared the heck out of him, but he doesn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think there are some incredibly fascinating reports. And Utah, you know, Utah is, uh, it was a little bit tricky because there are not uh, as extensive uh, databases on a lot of the old new Utah newspapers, the the regional ones, the smaller papers. Mm. Uh, so it's a bit harder to dig for a state like that. Although I did find some fascinating things. And uh, certainly when you get into the more modern era, uh, there were plenty of reports that came up in newspapers, you know, uh, 60s and 70s. You know, we had reports of Bigfoot. Mm. And uh, again, it's a state with a lot of wild area and a lot of fascinating encounters because of that. It's it's one of those areas as well that seems to to get overlooked, I think, sometimes, unless you're really into the subject of Bigfoot. Because I love these particular points in history where certain places seem to be suddenly awash <laughs> with Bigfoots. And 1977 seems to be a yeah. really big year for Bigfoot sightings. For me, especially as one of them is one of those rare ones where people describe seeing a white Bigfoot. Yes. Yes. Uh, and, you know, Paul, I'd actually, I would even back up uh, a little bit from that because one of my, uh, prior to that encounter, uh, one of my favorites out of the state of Utah came from the summer of 77. Mm. And it involved uh, two couples. Yeah. Who, they had this uh, encounter in uh, early July of 77, but they didn't report it until later on. Uh, in part because one of the gentlemen was uh, from an, from the Hill Air Force Base. He was a sergeant. And I think that they were very hesitant because of, you know, coming out with something like this. Uh, but two couples, uh, they were around an area um, in Davis County, uh, a lake, um, uh, Elizabeth Lake. Mm -hmm. And what they saw were a trio of Bigfoot creatures who were, quote, romping around in a clearing. Yeah. And <laughs> they observed this for, you know, like 10 minutes or so and described these creatures in, in good detail and said that they, they ran with these tremendous strides. But, uh, you know, we're essentially talking about an account of, you know, four people, four adults who were, you know, in a, a great spot to observe these creatures, gave a good description, and essentially saw these creatures playing and having a good time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's it. There wasn't anything more dramatic. You know, the creatures, they didn't say the creatures chased them or anything like that. So it was, you know, it was very much just this is what we saw. And they were positive that they weren't bears. Uh, they were bipedal. They they described uh, that they were covered with with hair and that they had human-like arms and legs, um, and that the the hands and the feet were pretty much free of hair. Mm. And now, this, of course, matches, you know, a lot of the descriptions that we have of, of these creatures. Uh, one of the most stunning things was that uh, one of the creatures was reportedly uh, about 10 feet tall. Yeah. And this is something that crops up in a lot of these 
Utah sightings, the creatures reported are frequently very large. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's nothing to hear of, of eight and 10 foot tall creatures being spotted uh, out in Utah. And uh, I don't, maybe it's the clean air. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, yeah, certainly following that, uh, there's a number of encounters. There's a group of hikers uh, that spot a, uh, a creature. There's um, there's a sighting of what appears to be a, a white-haired Bigfoot. You know, some of the accounts you read, well, it could have been really, really light blonde hair. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, you, you hear this diversity. And um, there does seem to have been a whole, whole cluster of sightings. And primarily the, the summer and fall of 77 up in the Uintas. Mm. Have you ever come across many stories about people witnessing them at play, David? Because I am hard pressed to think of anything that matches the quality of both of the accounts. Because the first one, as you say, you've got four people who were had a clear view of these th three creatures frolicking about and having a really good time for several minutes. And they were adamant in the fact that they didn't know what they were, but they knew what they weren't because of how they were acting and what they were doing. I can't think of any other witness account off the top of my head of people seeing them mucking about and having fun. Yeah, it's it's pretty unique. Now, I will say that, you know, I have some accounts and uh, there's another book that we'll discuss uh, later that has an account of a uh, juvenile Bigfoot that appears to be playing. And I, I've heard that a few times mm -hmm. uh, on typically with a, an older creature standing nearby observing or, you know, yeah. making sure that, that nothing happens. But this case out of Utah is, is pretty unique in that, you know, the way these people observed it and the way they talked about it, it it's, you get this, I, I don't know, you get this idea of, you know, like, <laughs> three college kids out for some drinking and some rousing, you know, it's, it's, it's so strange, you know, these, oh, these three creatures were romping around in this clearing, you know, what exactly were they doing? They were just having a good time, I guess, and blowing off some steam. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's kind of curious to me that we have that account and then we have some that are, are almost the polar opposite because there's another one that I found particularly fascinating out of Utah that occurred in, uh, 2004, and it was a pair of hunters who were out um, near a place called uh, Chalk Creek. And they were, they climbed out of a meadow and they spotted this uh, something. They didn't know what it was at first. Bipedal, very large, uh, black in color. And they heard it make this wild kind of huffing sound, you know, wolfing sound. And they observed it moving. Now they were, they said they were about 30 feet from this thing. So they had a good view of it. Uh, but what was interesting was that one of the gentlemen said, uh, they started backing up to get away from this thing. And as they did, it let out this low kind of guttural growl. And this gentleman said you could feel you could hear the the thing's teeth chattering as it was doing that vibration. Mm. And this this hunter said specifically said uh, I have felt fear uh, before, but a sense of evil came over me. Mm. So you know this is a whole different level of aggression that it is just kind of uh, I, I guess disturbing in a sense. And it, it turned out uh, the, the account is even more fascinating to me because it turned out that um, a gentleman, an investigator named uh, Todd Strong uh, spoke with these witnesses and he found out that one of the men had worked as a licensed hunting guide and wildlife artist for years. <laughs> so this is somebody who <laughs> is, again, very familiar with the wildlife, the environment. He knows what he's seen, and he knows what he's not seen. He knew that was not a bear. Mm. He said that the thing had uh, jet black hair, that it wasn't fur. And he described a creature that was about nine feet tall. Mm. So, you know, this is, uh, as I said, this is one of those accounts that makes you go, whoa. If there's ever a perfect observe, perfect observer, I mean, you know, how do you get much better than someone who's been 
painting wildlife for, <laughs> you know, for hunting years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are some fabulous reports and there always has been from Utah. I always remember the guy, I remember seeing a report on the guy who was driving a snowplow, David, I think about 2005. And he saw it clearly illuminated in, in his headlights. He said mm-hmm. he walked across the road. I, I could see exactly what it was. It was yeah. it was something I've never seen in my life. And people went, oh, are you sure you didn't see a man? And you think, hang on, he's driving a snowplow. Oh, right, yeah. Right? <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not June the 15th. You know, we've got a guy up a mountain with a snowplow trying to clear the road. And you're, you're going, oh, he's probably seen a guy. And, and, yeah. I think one of the other reports that makes me chuckle, it, sometimes the, the human brain works in strange ways, David, that somebody saw one in June. And at first they thought it was a person wearing a fur coat. <laughs> right, and you, and you just think, but that's how your mind works. I would imagine, David, that sometimes you think you, you can't comprehend what you're seeing because it's not supposed to exist, and therefore you think that in the height of summer in Utah, which gets quite hot, I mean, it can get up to a hundred degrees in the summer, can't it? There, depending on whereabouts in the state you are, that you would presume that it's a, a man in a in a fur coat, right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know, people go to great lengths, of course, uh, you know, when you're talking about things that are outside of their uh, accepted paradigm, you know, the brain tries to rationalize it into something that uh, is understandable. And, well, you know, we know people wear fur coats, uh, but, you know, all all those pieces don't fit together. They don't, you know, stop and think, oh, wait a minute, it's June, you know, why are they wearing a fur coat. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, I think as an explanation that we'll often get touted whenever we talk about Bigfoot, David, people will say, oh, they're just misidentifying bears. Now, yeah. black bears don't get to anywhere near some of those sizes that people report, do they? A grizzly oh, would. Right. But right. one of the brilliant stories in the book features a legendary grizzly bear that was killed and from that point on there have been no grizzly bears really in the state so all these reports in the 70s they're either seeing a grizzly bear that isn't supposed to exist there as seeing <laughs> unlike any grizzly bear anybody's ever reported witnessing or they're seeing something else aren't they that's right that's right so you can't explain it with a creature that doesn't exist in the state because <laughs> that's just <laughs> that's even stranger you know, we're, we're in Black Panther territory there, David. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it would be sad of me not to mention at least one of the strange water creatures before we, we dive into one further strange monster before that. And um, I know I jokingly said before we started the chat properly, Bear Lake monster is probably, for me, the most frustrating lake creature in North America, David. <laughs> because <laughs> it seems to be one that is still with us. I still see, I, I saw an article the other week talking about the Bear Lake monster. And it's one of those that I've never really been able to kind of settle with, to be honest. Um, I, I don't know whether it's one of those. If it, if it is, it's probably the biggest hoax out of all of them when I compare it with, with creatures like Champ or Ogopogo, or Memphrey, or others further north in the country. But, I mean, Bear Lake, I mean, it's just a mess anyway, because there seems to be so many stories, and then you've got somebody claiming he'd made it all up, and he'd convinced everybody it was true, but then sightings predated his his account, and they've obviously gone on afterwards. It's a bit of a mess, is Bear Lake, isn't it? It, it is a real mess. Uh, <laughs> it's... You know, it's it's fascinating on the one hand because it's another one of these stories that has become this uh, sort of magical blend of um, maybe some factual accounts, but certainly a lot of legend and folklore and uh, some of those early news stories that we talked about earlier that probably were fabricated. <laughs> you know, some Native American legend thrown in. Uh, the Mormons for good measure, <laughs> and, uh, you know, a couple of modern accounts too, but uh, Bear Lake, uh, you know, it's, it's a beautiful place. It's, oh, it's, oh, I don't know, just over a hundred square miles. And, um, it sits actually on the border of Utah and Idaho. So it stretches into both states. And, uh, this is, you know, we're talking about a very, uh, scenic place. It sits at almost 6,000 feet elevation. And uh, it's, it's nicknamed the Caribbean of the Rockies. 
mm-hmm. uh, because of its beauty. And there's a lot of unique uh, fauna in the area. Uh, but the lake itself, yeah, there's there's some mysterious things about it. It's uh, it's a very old body of water. It's, oh, I think something like a quarter of a million years old. And uh, there's a lot of stories of this purported monster that it is in Bear Lake. Now, you know, once you start getting into the monster stories, you kind of go down the rabbit hole. If you go back to the roots of it, you'll learn that there's uh, supposedly a Native American tale about uh, two lovers who were from opposite sides, you know, opposite tribes, and uh, had rendezvoused, you know, near the shore of the lake, and uh, they were about to be overtaken by warriors from both sides. uh, And, you know, just as this was happening, the Great Spirit essentially transformed them into these giant fish and sent them into the lake where they could... uh, live together. But then, of course, you know, it can't be that simple with a lot of these native tales, you know, these enormous fish uh, out of, I don't know, a sense of uh, revenge or karma or whatnot would occasionally um, come out and and eat people. So, (laughs) you know, right (laughs) from the get-go, we've got something purportedly monstrous that's in there. And then over the years, we get all these other tales that come along and There were a series of stories that were published uh, in the 1800s that all talked about this this creature. Uh, Primarily, there was a gentleman uh, named Joseph Rich who started writing accounts. And uh, he wrote for a newspaper that's still around to to this day. It's the Deseret News. Mm. And uh, the Deseret News in the old late 1860s started running Rich's accounts. and. he was chronicling all of these different uh, sightings of the Bear Lake monster and these in- encounters. And uh, at one point, the uh, Mormon president, you know, purportedly was interested in launching some kind of expedition or trying to find the, the Bear Lake monster. That's uh, Brigham Young for those yep. who are familiar. Uh, so, you know, we get this just this bizarre mix of things. There's there's even a wide variation of descriptions of this creature. You know, sometimes it seems to be, a, it does seem to be a giant fish of some type. Other times it seems to be something that's more a combination of various animals that don't necessarily make any sense when combined together. Uh, you know, sometimes it's reported to be more alligator-like. Uh, and, you know, ultimately, I think that... Um, What we probably genuinely have is uh, there there are probably some large fish living in that lake. It's pretty deep. Uh, Whether they're still there or not, I I don't know. But it could, this could be a case of where we had something like a sturgeon or, you know, a giant catfish, something akin to that as a known species that uh, is not seen that frequently, but is extremely large and uh, to some people would appear rather monstrous. Uh, and that's sort of blended with, uh, at this point, folklore and urban legend and, uh, so forth. You know, I, unlike locations, uh, like Lake Champlain, we just don't have a huge body of modern accounts to look at and say, uh, and, and exa- to examine and say, okay, well, you know, what exactly are these people seeing? Could it be this or this, or, or is it something completely unknown? Mm. Mm. I always remember seeing the, uh, is it the Brian Hershey? I think that's his, how you pronounce his surname, that um, he claimed to have seen it. And I know the local press dismissed it primarily because he reported his sighting just as tourist season was about to start. Yeah. And, and, and Brian, <laughs> Brian, purely by coincidence, had a big boat that looked like a sea serpent. Pure coincidence. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> purely coincidence, David. I'm saying. Pure coincidence. But you know, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the last creature I want to touch on might not seem so fantastical to some, but I've always been interested in these reports from across the States. Along with these mysterious desert camels that occasionally turn up and the weird stories associated with some of those sightings. Phantom kangaroos, David, yes. uh, <laughs> are one of those weird things, primarily because. Here in the UK, obviously, we've got some odd colonies of wallabies 
that's lurk right. around, yeah. which yeah. often surprises anybody when they stumble across them. But once again, it just shows that certain creatures can adapt. But the thing about a lot of these kangaroo encounters is that people see them, they call the police out, there's a big chase, and nothing's found. Right. And then the, the kangaroo seems to disappear, and it's just, that's the end of the story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, like you, I've always been really fascinated by these, uh, just because, you know, well, we know that kangaroos exist. Uh, we know they don't, you know, uh, live in the wild in the United States, at least they're not supposed to. And, you know, we know that uh, it's an animal that people, when they see it, it's it's very distinctive. You know, it's not like, well, it was, I, I saw a wolf, you know, well, did you really see a wolf or was it a coyote or was it a, you know, a, a wild dog? You know, there's, there's a lot of similarities there, but what's similar to a kangaroo? Yeah. And, you know, this, there's one particular story out of, there, there's found kangaroo stories in, in several locations across the United States, but I think one of my favorites is out of Utah and it happened in uh, the summer of 1981, uh, a rancher named Ray All. Uh, he just goes out on what he assumes is going to be a, another regular day to check on his flock of sheep. <laughs> and as he's observing the sheep, uh, out of the midst of them, uh, an animal jumps six feet into the air. <laughs> and, you know, just the image of that, I mean, you're just calmly looking at a flock of sheep and suddenly something just bounces, up, <laughs> you know, six feet up into the air. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, he observes this thing. And this is a man who... Oh, I think he spent something like 50 years at that point uh, raising sheep in this, you know, range in, uh, <laughs> near Utah Lake. And, you know, uh, he's not imagining or hallucinating. No, he's not seeing a sheep do something weird. No, this is, he says, this is a kangaroo. Mm. And he, uh, you know, he told people about it. And of course, he, he, you know, people kind of poke fun at him, at him at first, but he, yeah. he called the area zoo. And he said, there's, you know, I, I saw a kangaroo. Did you guys lose a kangaroo? And of course, no, we didn't, you know, we didn't lose a kangaroo. And, <laughs> uh, you know, he, he contacted uh, another uh, area uh, that had another place in the area that supposedly had marsupials. No, they hadn't lost any. And it just is this completely weird thing that suddenly a, a kangaroo just shows up in the midst of this man's flock of sheep. And, uh, bounces away and and all you know he even said he says i i know exactly what it was i've seen kangaroos on on television and you know uh, i i know you know what other animals in this region look like and that that was a kangaroo that was out there with my sheep so ultimately you know there was a conclusion that or speculation rather that oh well it maybe was somebody's exotic pet that got away or something uh but there was never <laughs> any evidence, you know, nobody reported this, never any evidence that that's exactly what it was. And, uh, you know, it just kind of came and went and that was, that was sort of it. Mm-hmm. But there are a few other, over the years have been a few other reports of uh, anomalous kangaroos in Utah. And, uh, I don't know, you know, maybe they're trying to find their way back to the outback, but <laughs> You know, you just some of the other reports, um, the alt case is covered in the book, and there's mm-hmm. there's mention of uh, just that there were some other incidents. I tried to chase some of those accounts down, but yeah, you know, I found one woman who just really didn't want to talk about it or even tell me, you know, exactly where she had seen them. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, people are just reluctant because uh, when the animals never captured and it's never proven, they don't want to be made fun of or anything like that. Uh, but there was. There's a weird series of stories from the 1950s that actually happened around the whole Southwest region, including Utah, where people were reporting seeing what they said were screaming kangaroos. Uh, these weird kangaroo-like creatures that would issue this blood-curdling scream that, that was just obviously found quite disturbing. Uh, but, you know, nothing ever came of that either, and they never proved anything from that. So. Mm. Again, you know, there could be a logical explanation. It could indeed be an exotic pet or something, you know, if it had, if it had happened, uh, you know, 50 or 100 years ago, the immediate blame would have been put on the circus or, <laughs> or traveling shows. But, yeah. you know, who do you blame now? You yeah. know, now they've kind of shifted that over. Oh, well, it was a, a, an exotic pet owner, you know, to, 
kangaroo got loose. So. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, likely if somebody's keeping kangaroos, their property probably has a massive fence around it to try to keep these <laughs> things in. Because otherwise, they're not going to happen. And I, yeah. I think that would stand out. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah, well, they, yeah, they don't strike me as the kind of pet that would settle well in a domestic setting. And obviously, you know, they're one of those creatures that, yeah, they do look lovely and they're very cute and quite unique, but they can kill you. Um, oh, yes. You know, that a, a male kangaroo is is a, a fully grown one that's that look. I mean, there's tons of footage of kangaroos crushing tin cans and all sorts that will yes. that will really make you raise your eyebrows because I think some people have this perception of them being cute marsupials but mm-hmm. you know you, you can get really hurt you know I, I spoke to a couple of people in australia and they were once telling me they were once at a fair and they had to rescue one of their friends from being attacked by one right and he was he he got a right beating off it and it wasn't a particularly big one david so it, it they are strange because I, I, I doubt that there's a law against keeping kangaroos in utah or so i would imagine there are in many states because they probably think well why would anybody want one but you know, people are strange. I know there was that report the other year about that chap that kept cassowaries, which is, yeah. and, and and unfortunately, the, the poor gentleman was killed by it. And you're talking about keeping one of the most dangerous flightless birds in the world as a pet. And he'd had it years, and then one day it just turned on him and killed him. So Yeah, well, an even greater level of madness is if you look at the amount of people that keep, uh, you know, snakes. Yeah. I, I, you know, they're keeping these pythons and boa constrictors and you know these snakes that can grow to massive size it doesn't make any sense to me but uh, you know okay <laughs> yeah because yeah. they'll always you know every couple of years there'll always be a tragic story i remember being on holiday once and it was in on the news in the country i was in even though it happened in the states about um i think it was a python that had escaped overnight and, and killed their child yeah that was a florida case so it's you know like florida needs any more pythons don't you? <laughs> right <laughs> well as always david utah is another wonderful collection of fabulous stories with a deep dive into the the weird and wonderful skinwalker ranch along those hundreds almost of of pages of fantastic stories covering bigfoot and as we've said water babies and many other strange things such as weird humanoids and all kinds of monsters and giant snakes and all sorts down there so where can everybody get hold of a copy and follow your work going forwards well it is available on uh, amazon.com and both uh, paper and kindle edition and of course you can find links on my website which is erielights.com that is e-e-r-i-e l-i-g-h-t-s.com you'll find all kinds of stuff on there, some articles, news about uh, events and so forth, upcoming titles and appearances and so forth. So check it out. Fantastic as always. David, it's been a wonderful pleasure as always spending some more time in your company and hopefully we will speak soon, sir. Always good catching up, Paul. Thanks.